Okay, so consider this part two of our how to work with materials and models in Source 2. So our first video covered exporting the models and materials from Hammer and just copying the materials from uh, the asset browser using print screen sequence. Uh, but instead, we're going to now cover importing uh, those same assets back in. Like, say you wanted to take a prop out of a game and give it a different texture. Um, this is more or less how you'd go about doing that. This video is going to cover the material editor and basic model importing. Uh, earlier videos covered this in some more detail, uh, but this is going to cover specifically just static geometry. So what we're going to do is first... You're going to want to not. Uh, you're going to want to find your uh, your well your work folder. So in my case, uh, I'm just using the Dota 2 Beta Content Dota Add-ons uh, directory, and I have my own testbed folder here where I just mess about with uh, custom assets. Uh, so what I've gone ahead and done is made my own Aegis folder, and using the same source style uh, hierarchy system, I have a models fol folder, which has my uh, Aegis OBJ, and materials folder, which then has its own models folder, and a series of textures. Now, we have a color PSD, which I've gone ahead and made this nice bright cyan and magenta colored Aegis, just to test the custom imports. I've also gone ahead and upscaled these textures using Waifu 2X just so they're a little sharper and nicer looking. Um, and one of the cool things about uh, Source 2 is that it can use, it can read PSD files as color textures, so that's great. Uh, I've also gone ahead and done this for the uh, normal map as well as the specularity map, uh, rim light mask, and the, uh, the green channel of that uh, shader mask, which I assume now is the metalness mask. And I've gone ahead and exported those all as, uh, as targets. So now what we're going to do is cover importing your, uh, your geometry. So I've already gone ahead and done this, but uh, just to cover that, uh, to import your geometry, you want to click on this little stick figure. This is the model editor. This will bring up this little uh, session wizard, which just shows recently imported uh, files. What I'm going to do is click new MV, uh, sorry, new VMDL from mesh file. And what that's going to ask me to do is navigate to my Aegis model, Aegis OBJ file, and open that up, and click OK. And that's it. It just compiles it. You don't need to install Studio MDL or do any of that nonsense like the old Source SDK. It's just done inside the tools. It's amazing. And if I really wanted to, I could save over that OBJ file I just uh, I just um, imported, and it will automatically update it. So if I wanted to say make this a really fat Aegis, like I wanted to make this a really wide looking Aegis. Uh, I could just file export OBJ and save over this. And if I go, it's already, before I even alt tabbed back, it's already imported it. So that is incredible. I'm gonna undo that though, because I don't want a fat Aegis. I want like a, a regular Aegis. So I'm just gonna save over that and it's already fixed. So if you're familiar with source modding, you've probably run into this error texture plenty of times. It's just a glowing red wireframe. Um, and that way it's just blatantly telling you this isn't connected to anything. Uh, and we're going to import, we're going to make a, a material for this very, uh, very quickly. So right next to the model importer is the material editor. And here I've already gone ahead and made a custom material, but I'm going to go ahead and just quickly run down the basics. You're going to hit new. The first things you want to do is hit save. And this should load up um, your last imported directory. In this case, I'm in models. I'm just going to go back to Aegis, hit materials, models, and then 
I'm in my materials models fo uh, folder. And here I'm just going to save it as custom ages.bmat. Just save that. And now it will let me preview. So by default, it normally highlight, uh, lets you preview it on a sphere. But instead, I want to preview it on the Aegis. So I'm going to click this little stick figure icon. And uh, this allows me to preview it on any model I want, even if it's not set up for the specific material. So I'm going to click on this little magnifying glass. And here I can see a number of uh, different assets. Like if I wanted to preview this on the error model, I could. But instead, I'm just going to click the Aegis we just imported. So here it is. Uh, there's no normal map, there's no color map, there's nothing. It's just the plain model. So what I'm going to do is change this uh, the shader setting, global lit simple, to one of these pre-made shaders. I'm not entirely sure what Half-Life Alex's shaders will look like. I'm sure they'll have simple materials set up for uh, skies, uh, shadow receivers. Um, they have different shader setups for crystals, cables, uh, water. Uh, I'm sure Half-Life Alex will have many, many different uh, shader types, but I'm just going uh, off of Dota 2's pre-made shaders. In this case, I'm going to use Hero as our sort of default shader because it covers just about every different uh, material we really need. I'm just going to quickly save that. So, how do we use the material editor? Well, first things first, uh, on this first panel uh, in the Properties tab, we have things like two-sided rendering. So if you wanted to, if you had like a flat piece of paper, like that was a, a single polygon uh, that you, or something that you wanted to uh, render on both sides without having to model thickness, you could just click render back faces and that would effectively double your uh, poly count, but it will render uh, the back and the front of a, a single polygon thick piece of geometry, but we don't really need to render back faces since this is a solid chunk of geometry. There's also things for translucency, um, uh, the different shader masks, masks one and two. I will go over these in detail uh, soon. Uh, detail masks, which are things like scrolling textures. So if something, uh, if you had like uh, something that you wanted to have like a scrolling fire effect on it, this is what you would uh, do. And I can cover that as well. Uh, specular cube maps, this is for really fancy shiny reflections. Color warps, diffuse warps, uh, specular warps, Fresnel warps, there's a lot of different warps you can use. I'm really only familiar with diffuse. Um, and then we've got some other things. Enable cloak, I don't even know what that does. Morph supported, I'm not entirely sure what that does. Um, effect proxies, I have no idea what those are. But you have other things like do not cast shadows, do not reflect, cast shadows only. So if you wanted an object to cast a specific shape or shadow, you could set up a model to do that and then have it only cast shadows so you wouldn't see the model it's, uh, at all. You could use this for many different visual tricks, but I can't really name any off the top of my he uh, head right now. But then you could also have things that don't reflect or don't cast shadows at all. If you wanted like a, an orb of light to appear in front of the player, but you don't want the orb of light itself to cast shadows because, well, light can't really ob ob obstruct light if it's emitting light. Um, there, you've also got a wind shader. So if you wanted something to sort of wobble in the wind or like, uh, like leaves or hair, then uh, enabling wind would be a good way to do that. Dota 2 uses this for uh, uh, a lot of its foliage models. Uh, I know Dota Underlords uses it for Hobgin's hair just by looking at it. Um, then again, it could be a different sh uh, shader setup. I could be completely wrong about that, but my best guess is that it is using the wind function. Uh, they've got separate transform for alphas, separate transforms for normal. So if you wanted to, uh, if you wanted to have the transform of the normal map or the alpha map scroll along a model to achieve a different effect, um, like you could, uh, you could, um, you could make a very simple water effect by uh, scrolling the normal map along a surface. It, there's a lot of different things you can do with these shaders, and it's really fun to play with. Now I'm going to go over actually playing with them. So first things first, we want our color map. So I'm going to click this little magnifying glass, and it's going to ask me to uh, 
type in its name. Luckily, it's right here, ages color. Um, by default, it sets its suffix to underscore color, and that will highlight everything with a color map on it. So I'm just gonna click on ages color, and bam, there it is. Um, but we wanna add some like nice fancy reflections to this, otherwise this is just a flat color. So uh, first we want our normal map, and there it is, ages underscore normal. Um, but say, let's say you change, you name your files however you want. You can't find them at all. Let's say you named your Aegis Bob. Uh, if you couldn't find it here because you didn't have the suffix normal, you can simply backspace, uh, backspace that and type in Bob. And oh, hey, look, here are Bob's textures. This is for a completely different asset that I made ages ago for a different tutorial. But you don't have to adhere strictly to Valve's specific naming conventions, but I would definitely uh, advise doing that because it just keeps everything nice and uh, nice and simple. So I'm going to select normal, and now we have our normal, uh, our normal map plugged in, but we can't really see uh, the normal map taking effect. So now we're going to add some specularity, but and he all, this this model already has specularity, but I can't see it. That's because we don't have these masks enabled. So I'm going to enable mask number two, where specularity is stored. So the specular ma mask right here doesn't have anything plugged into it. It's already loaded the rim mask, and I haven't even had to do anything. So if you if one thing that uh, Valve does uh, is they've more or less sort of hard-coded in their uh, their file name suffixes. So because I named one of the textures rim mask, it's already plugged in. But where's the specular mask? Well, that's because I named it specular mask instead of spec mask. Um, so it's just defaulted to this sort of uh, dark matte gray. Now, if, if your model was very simple and didn't actually need its own texture for a specular mask, well, that, it's, re it's really easy to alter that because they've... And not, you have the choice between using an image map or just setting a value on a color ramp. Now, I'm, not, I'm still not seeing this updated on... Oh, now I remember. So, say you wanted to preview this on your imported model. You may not get the same... Uh, like here I can see specular on this test model, but I'm not seeing it on my preview model. That's because I haven't even set a material on it. So now we have to go back and set this. So by default, it has created an error material. If, I'm in, if you go to your model viewer, you can see that it's just got, uh, it's got no collision. It's just got the Aegis uh, geometry and no material. So very simple setup. Uh, this was a workaround that I learned from uh, Anuxi, a fellow workshopper. Uh, shout out to her for figuring this out. And all you need to do is add a material group and a material remap. So under material groups, it creates a default. And over here in the property editor, you have to click this uh, plus button to open up the materials. And I'm going to set this to our Aegis VMAT that we made earlier. And we can see that that has been set here, but it's still not showing. Well, that's because we need to remap it. You go to your material remap list, and you click material remap zero. You click this drop down over here, you select default, you click default, and you reapply VMAT there. Now it's done. And now we're starting to see that speculate. So before we do anything else, I'm going to hit save and I'm going to go back to our material editor and I'm going to hit save. Just there we are. We've refreshed everything. Sometimes it takes a little while for source two to catch up. I don't know why it disabled the texture there, but uh, now I can edit the specularity. So here on this slider, I've got it to the one. I can set this all the way down to zero and it's perfectly matte. But say your geometry is comp uh, uh, complex enough that it does need its own uh, shader map for specularity. So in this case, I'm just going to click this magnifying glass and I'm going to backspace spec mask and just type in just 
and find my specular mask. I'm going to open that up. And now you can see, uh, if I go back to Photoshop, these dark parts of the, uh, the ages are not reflected, but these uh, shinier parts here are reflected. Let's say I want that shinier. Well, if we scroll up back to the specular tab, I can set the specular scale so I can leave it on one or turn it all the way up to 1000 and just have this very, very bright, very reflective model. This doesn't look that great. So we got to work in moderation. I like to work in powers of two. So say four or eight or 16. So let's set it to eight. That's pretty shiny. That's pretty good. I can also change the specular exponent, which is how glossy or how sharp the uh, specular highlight is. So if I set this all the way up to say 512, you can see that it is a very small uh, specular highlight. It's a very glossy reflection. But if I change this all the way down to one, you can see it's a very large, a very sort of matte finish. But I'm just going to go ahead and set it to 32, the default, which is a pretty good, decently sized specularity reflection. So now I'm going to plug in uh, the metalness mask. Now, metalness isn't covered under mask 2. It just covers specularity, rim, tint, and specular exponent. Uh, if we click mask one over here in the properties tab, this will load up uh, uh, four more different shaders we can work with, which are detail, diffuse warp, metalness, and self-illumination. So right now it's defaulted self-illumination to be full bright. So now this thing isn't even casting shadows on itself. I'm just gonna click on the slider, drag that all the way down to zero. Okay. Now we've got our reflection back. I'm going to go ahead and save our progress. Now I've noticed the metalness mask didn't import properly because I didn't export it properly. That was my mistake. I'm going to go back into Photoshop. I'm going to open up my uh, metalness mask. Remember that this was supposed to be just the blue channel. So I'm going to copy that, paste it over, and just save over that. And like I mentioned earlier, it has already automatically updated. Uh, has already updated the uh, material. And now I'm starting to realize this is definitely not the metalness mask because now it is creating these ugly black spots on the uh, on these little uh, bolts here on the shield. So instead, I'm going to change the metalness mask to just a quick slide. As you can see, Fulbright makes the whole thing completely black. It's almost like it's covered in oil. But if I bring this down to like, like 0.5, let's put it on 0.6. That's more reasonable. As far as I can tell, the metalless slider just makes the the overall like color of the model uh, darker while ignoring the um, the specular highlight. So I'm going to set this to 0.6. Uh, the detail mask and the diffuse warp uh, are fine for now. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to tint by base mask and put the metal mask into that. Now you can play with this however you want and figure out all these different ways to render different surfaces. Um, there are so many different things you can do with the material editor. Um, like I'm just glossing over a lot of basic stuff, uh, but let's import the metalness mask into there. There we go. That's no, that, that was definitely the tint base. So what tint base does is it samples the color map underneath the specularity, and it colors your specular highlight um, that particular uh, color. It's a really really good way to make uh, reflected metal look really nice. In fact, if I turn the metalness of this up some more, you can probably see that reflected better. Yeah, if I turn it all the way up, you can see those uh, specular reflections are now uh, sampling that purple. I'm going to turn that back down to six. 
So now, uh, this is like more or less just it, but I can go over some simple uh, tricks that you can uh, do with the material editor to get certain effects. So another thing I just want to cover real quick is the rim highlight. So by default, it's to one, you can set it to a hundred and that makes the rim highlight really, really bright. You can't really see it that well. There we go. You can see it much better from this side. So this is basically like Fresnel, almost. Uh, I'm just going to set it to something like four. And your rim highlight intensity can be controlled by, well, a rim mask, in this case, uh, used here in the second slot of mask number two. And I can like turn that off if I want to, or turn it back on. And you can see the subtle differences between changing it. But again, this is just scratching the surface on what is possible with um, your material editor. So let's say I wanted to make this, let's say I wanted to make this like have a cool glowing fire effect. One of the ways we can do that is by clicking, going to the detail tab underneath the uh, properties tab. So if I select uh, add, it's, it's now got this bright like, detail over it. Why is it all bright? Well, if you scroll down in your variables tab, you can see this big bright detail map here. By default, it's just a single like white map that's sort of overlaid on top of the entire model. Now, let's say I only want this to appear on certain parts of this Aegis. Well, in this case, you would go to mask one and you would have this detail mask and this would will effectively mask out the details. So I'm going to load in, I'm going to load in the, I'm going to load in the specular mask. There, now you can see that it is, so it's sort of selectively letting this detail ma uh, mask appear on top of this. But let's say I don't want this single white color. Let's say I want fire or lightning or something. Let's go with lightning. So under the detail uh, tab, I'm going to hit open texture browser and by default, it loads up all these different detail textures that are stored within Dota 2. Um, let's go with Razor's electricity. And you can see that it's sort of changed completely, but it's just sort of static. It doesn't move around. Like I can change the texture scale. Like let's say, let's change the scale to four on both axes. There we go. Now I can see that lightning far, uh, far more now, but uh, it's still not doing anything. Well, I can change the texture coordinate offset. That's sort of what I want, but I have to manually adjust that. What if it's not doing it automatically? Well, that's where we get dynamic expressions. And I cannot remember any dynamic expressions off the top of my head, but I can teach you one by simply opening another VMAT. So I'm going to open, let's get the VMAT from, let's get the VMAT from Haney's sword. So Haney is a custom hero that I made a long time ago. And just give this a second to load. The source two tools do hang from time to time. Hope this doesn't crash. Again, please excuse the unscripted nature of these tutorials. I am not the best teacher. So here, it is now loaded Haney's sword into a different tab, and you can see the scrolling effect at work here. You can see that this is clearly not mapped properly because it is still previewing on the Aegis model. I'm just going to scroll down to the detail tab. And now we have this little FX uh, button. See, if you hit this little drop down uh, button, you can reset the settings. You can reset any of these like settings to their default uh, presets. But there's another option called uh, add dynamic expression. And what that does, it creates this little button. If you click that, you can edit this mathematical equation that uh, 
tells our texture what to do. And in this case, it is frac float to one zero multiplied by time. I'm not entirely sure what that means. Um, I'm sure anyone who's familiar with uh, technical art will know what it means, but I'm just gonna copy this, this expression. Uh, I'm just gonna leave it on screen so you can write it down too. It is more or less going to do the same thing. Okay, I'm gonna close that, close Handy Sword, and I'm gonna go back to our detail mask here. And I'm just going to click this little button, click Add Dynamic Expression. And I'm adding this to the texture coordinate offset. You could add this to rotation or scale and or the blend factor, and it would do probably a myriad of different things. But in this case, I'm just going to use it for texture coordinate offset and dynamic expression. And now we can see that it's moving. Now, both these numbers coordinate with these different axes. I'm assuming float two specifically references these two values here. In this case we have the x-axis one and the y-axis zero. So I can change these both to zero and it stops animating. If I change this to one, now it starts going up. Uh, if I change this to two, it starts going up faster. If I change it to four, now it's going really fast. So I'm just gonna save that. And we've got this cool lightning effect scrolling up on our, on our, on our edges. And you can see that it doesn't necessarily scroll on these sculpted detailed parts of it, but it's scrolling on the the purple metal parts. Yeah, let's say I wanted to change this to fire. I load like uh, one of these ugly looking fire textures. Like let's say this. Maybe even this. Or this. There's a lot of different things you can do. Hmm. I'm not liking how to scale this. Let's set it back to one. That's way too fast. Let's set this back to one. Let's let's change the uh, the detail mask to add self illumination, and now it's much brighter. In fact, it will probably glow if I turn off the bloom. Yeah. So if you set the detail to add self-illumination, then you can make it glow. Again, there's just so many different things you can do, but this is just covering like basic things that are done with the material editor. Sometimes I just get carried away and just keep playing with every little different thing I can get my hands on. You can also change the blend factor. So if it's too intense, you can turn it down. Yeah, now we have this lightning powered uh, Aegis that's cotton candy colored. You can even change the detail texture rotation, make it rota scroll in a different direction if I wanted to. I could probably even add a dynamic expression to the detail coordinate rotation that just causes the dynamically rotate all the time. But I digress. This is more or less how to just go about importing your models and materials and setting them up in the Source 2 tools. Another useful tool is this history tab. Now I can just go click each one of these different windows and it, it changes It'll always save like the last change you made. And if you wanted to preview like the difference between two different looking uh, material setups, you can very quick, easily click, quick, uh, click these two for uh, just a quick preview. Anyway, I'll save this as our final material, close that, and go back to our model viewer. And you can see it's already been applied because we've set it to that VMAT. So it's automatically been updated. And I can save that. This is our model. You can you can probably go ahead and like add and like if you have this rigged with a like named joint, you can then probably export import animations 
uh, add attachment points, do all sorts of neat stuff with this. And if I wanted to import this into a map, well, let's just open Hammer, hit File New, and whatever map file you're working on, if you just go back to your asset browser and find the, the custom Aegis we imported, I'll just click and drag that straight into Hammer. And there we go. It's already animated and everything. So yeah, this is just being uh, a very basic rundown on how to import the different models and materials you may have lying around into Source 2. Again, forgive the unscripted nature of these tutorials, but uh, if you do have any additional questions on the material editor or the model editor, uh, please leave a comment and I will do my best to cover them.